<laughs> well, I am delighted to be here, and this is one of my favorite subjects. So when she asked one time, does anyone have anything they could talk about? I said, oh, they can talk about lookout towers, because I just love lookout towers. So I thought I'd start with telling you why I care about towers, and maybe by the end, more people will care about towers. So it was actually my first job with the Forest Service. I was a co-op student, and I was hired, and it was a dry season. and in Missouri in the Ozarks there were at that time especially there were lots of arsonists so we had fires all the time and so this was my tower Eastwood Lookout Tower and so if it was a dry day first thing in the morning I would report to my workstation this was my workstation I would climb the tower I would look around and if it was especially a bad day I would spend my whole day here otherwise I would clear the tower I'll talk about that a little and I would make sure it was good I'm gonna like go back at lunch and check it again mid-afternoon and so this was my workstation, and so I just really learned to love towers by working the so tower. Stay up in there? If it was a bad day, I would stay up there all day for the fire season, which is in the spring and the fall, usually. So, and then after I left Missouri and came here, I didn't have much to do with towers for a while until I met Keith Argo 15, 20 years ago. I was at a meeting. He's a national chair of Lookout Towers. And I was talking to him about it, because he gave a little program on Lookout Towers. And I said, oh, I was so interested, because I used to work out. Where are you from? And I said, Indiana. He said, we need a chair for the Forest Fire Lookout Association for Indiana. And so <laughs> before I left that day, I was the new chair. And I've, so I've done that ever since. And this is a really good organization, so I'll leave some flyers up here. They do a magazine four times a year. I always bring them in here and leave them, so some of you may have taken one home. But, Anyway, so if you're at all interested by the end of the meeting, you might want, I think it's $15 a year or something. So it's a, it's a really great organization. So that's that. So Indiana, according to his, oh, <laughs> don't know what I can do about that. But I've also got to click the clicker. So can you just click, scoot a little? <laughs> I'll try not to move around, so. I'm not very wide. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I'll try to stand still. I don't have a clicker, so so you're good now? Anyway, so back when Indiana DNR celebrated their 100th anniversary, Bev Stout, who's with the DNR, she's retired now as well, but she and I did the fire history for Indiana. So we published this little book about the Indiana fire history. So at that time, we collected all the history we could because the Forest Service had a piece of it and DNR had a piece of it. So we could only find that fire towers, there were no fire towers before 1930. And that one, this is not a picture of it, this is a picture from um, Missouri. But I suspect there were fire towers before 1930 because I know there were in Missouri and this is what they look like. But the most recent, or the oldest tower I know of in, in Indiana, and I'll show you a picture of it, was a metal one. And metal ones didn't start until about 1930. Say what? You're, you're in front of the light. Go that way over there. There you go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> you guys have to keep me straight. We will hold the around. Okay. That's all right. So anyway. Would you like to have a clicker for somebody to sit there and do it for you? Well, he, he can't really do it, and so I need to see what I'm talking about. Otherwise, I'm talking to the screen. And I don't have a clicker, so sorry. But anyway, I also think that there were other towers because... Yeah. Say what? It's a tough crowd. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? So I don't know if you've ever hiked at Jackson, Washington State Forest, but like here's an example of why I know there were other towers, because at the highest point at Jackson, Washington, there's a point that says it was an old tower site. And so I asked the people that worked there, I asked if anyone knew Dick Rump, who worked at the History Center, and he said, I've had other people ask me that. We do think there was an old tower, but we can't find any pictures or any records of it. But the, there's old rock things with bolts in them, and they're certainly not far enough apart to be a proper lookout tower. It would be something like where you would have latched in something wooden. So we know there were towers prior to 1930, but we don't know what, much about them. So it was in the 1920s that people started realizing we needed fire towers. The soil was washing away, people were burning every year because they thought that would keep chicks and chiggers and ticks and snakes away, and so the soil was washing away, no, the trees were gone, and they couldn't get any trees back because of all the fires. And so they realized they needed, to, I like this quote from George White, it says, we can cut and use our forest over and over, as long as we can, can protect them from all the fires set by man and the comparatively few that are set by Jehovah. And so they decided they needed to do something to protect the forest. 
So, in Indiana, we are one of the few states at that time that had never done much elevation mapping. And so, they, which probably because most of the state, especially the important part of the state, was pretty flat, so they didn't have to do any elevation mapping. So it was kind of hit and miss how they figured out where to put the towers. And it is pretty deceptive if you think about it. If you think, well, where's the tallest hill? I bet it's that one. And so they put a tower up and 20 of the towers, 20, they erected 20 towers right away. And three of them had to be taken down and moved because it wasn't the tallest place. And they got up, put it up and they realized, oh, there's several places taller. And then 20 of them had to be, remainder needed. So three of them had to be dis. <laughs> I haven't practiced this enough. <laughs> So some of them had to be raised and been taller, and then they realized they didn't have enough to really properly cover it. And so this is an example of how they would have raised it. So this one in the middle was 50 feet tall, and then they just built the 100-foot one right over it. And this was an old windmill-based tower, so some of them were built like on windmill um, frames, and then they just had a little cabin on top. And there were a lot of these in Missouri. I have not seen many in Indiana that are still standing. There are a lot of them that are gone. But they wouldn't, weren't as sturdy as these big, like this is an aero motor tower, and I'll talk about it. And those are the ones that are mostly still around. And so then they built a 100-foot tower right over it, and they never had to lose a day of watching for fires. So that was pretty practical. And there's an old wooden tower, and we still had some of those in Missouri when I was there in the 70s. And that's what I think we had in some of these places in Indiana. But there are none. By the time I got here, I never saw a wooden tower. So I think a lot of them burned early on. Say what? That was a wooden one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that was a common thing, but they didn't last as long and well, yeah. Still there. Well, I'll we'll go on where some of them are. You can see if you still see it. So it's kind of like white pines where if you count the whirls, you can tell how old the, the tree is. Well, it's the same thing with lookouts. If you really know lookouts, you can count how many platforms there are and tell how tall there are. So those are just some examples how many times it goes back and forth which is just kind of cool. So in the early days, they tried to save money by making the ladders on the tower. See how that one has a ladder and doesn't have the stairs that go back and forth? So you could save, well, it's like half the, the poundage because you had to ship them. And they would just ship them. They would stencil the, on the struts. They would stencil the name of the CCC camp because the CCC built a lot of them. Or like the one that was up at um, Morgan Monroe, it had the name of just a farmer that lived nearby. And so the farmer would get the, the um, pieces, and then the state guys would come and, and pick it up. So it was just pieces that had addresses on them. But you could save a lot of money in shipping as well as the price, because you can see in 1930 dollars, it was like half the price almost if you didn't get the stairs. However, and there was, I've climbed the ones that are a ladder, and they're a whole lot scarier to climb, and especially if you're doing it in the rain or the dark, and if you have to carry stuff up, and you do have to carry stuff up, you know? You gotta carry your water, you gotta carry your, your lunch, and so they did make a conversion kit later, but they realized this may not have been such a good cost-saving measure. So, so did people actually have accidents on these, on, were, were there a lot of falls? I never or heard. Or was in, it just inconvenient? I think it was probably just inconvenient. I never heard of anybody falling, but I'm sure it probably happened. Yeah, it does to me too. So, um, wait, did I, looks like I'm missing something. Well, so Aeromotor was the one that made most of them. So International Derrick also made some. They um, converted a lot of old oil derricks, and then later they also made some that had a, the, but most of those did not have um, ladders or did not have the stairs, they just had ladders. So here's a map in 1952 that Bev and I, when we were doing the DNR fire history, I'm sorry, I keep moving around. Um, and at that time, Indiana had 33 standing lookout towers in 1952. Like I said, I think there were more earlier that didn't make it till 1952. But here's a list, so there's more than one page. So here's, there were two in Clark County, one in Crawford, Du Bois, Floyd Green. The one in Greene County, I couldn't find the last couple times I went down. Has anybody seen that Cincinnati Tower? That's still there. Is it still there? I mean, the, the, the top is gone, but the, the green itself is still so there. So part of it's gone? Yeah. Okay. Do you know where it is? I, I've seen it in the past, but the last two times I went down that road on Red Cross calls or whatever, I thought, I'm going to make sure I see it. I'll talk to you later. Okay. My, my father worked there one year, and I, I spent a lot of time with him. Okay. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, we do have to talk, yeah. So anyway, I was hoping it wasn't all the way gone, but maybe it's just partially gone. So anyway, so those are the ones 
and the, those counties, and I'll, I'll show you some in detail. So that's the Ferdinand Tower, and that one actually had a lot of rehab done. I, it was back when Obama was president, we went through one of the receptions, and there was ARRA money. I can't remember what ARRA stands for, maybe some of you remember. But several of the fire towers were, got money, and they were some restoration was done. So here is the oldest tower that we know of that's still standing, and that was the Henryville Tower. And it was built in 1928, and it's 94 foot tall. And at that time, it was supposed to cover 100,000 acres, which is a, a lot of land that it was supposed to be the lookout for. When my granddaughter and I climbed it, there were 42 padlocks stuck on it. Does anybody know what that means? Why people would put padlocks all over it? No, well, I was, romance yes, romance. my granddaughter had to explain that to me. <laughs> It's for Locks of love, she told me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Well, they were all over that tower. And there was also lots of very bad graffiti. She kept saying, Oma, don't look, this is bad. And she's 13. <laughs> she was about worried about her Oma being embarrassed. <laughs> but anyway, so that one, but it, it's really a cool tower and it, it has a great view. So that's a good one if you ever want to visit it. And then this one is down at O'Bannon Woods, the Wyandotte Tower. And this is one I think started out wood because it said it was burned in 1941. Built in 1932, burned in 1941. So it would make sense. It probably started out a wood tower and then they replaced it with this one. Now this one my granddaughter didn't climb. She only climbed about two. This one's too wobbly, Oma. <laughs> she went back down. So if you're... It was wobbly, but I climbed at the top. So if you're a little skittish about wobbly towers, don't go to that one. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, I don't think it'll fall down, but it was wobbly. Uh huh. Yeah, they are. I just love them. Yeah. So this is Skyline Tower, which you, many of you have probably seen over in Jackson, Washington, this, there by Brownstown. And so that's, again, it was probably built by the CCC, and it was, like most of them, it was um, used until the 70s. And it was also revamped, so it's been restored too with that ARRA money. So Georgia Tower is not standing, but a lot of you I thought would have known about Clarissa Carroll. Many of you may have met her. So she's one of the, there were actually several women that worked as lookout towers, especially, or lookout tower men, especially during World War II when the men all went off to war and they were short people to do it. So a lot of them stepped up. But she's one who said her husband actually was the one that was officially supposed to be the tower man, but he got bored. bored. He thought that was a boring job and he had more important things to do. So he said, Clarissa, why don't you run up and do that? So the DNR man came up one day and said, well, what are you doing up there? Where's your husband? And she said, well, he's out farming. He said, I should do the job. And he said, well, just keep on doing it. You're doing fine. And so she did. So she did it until from 1950 until the tower was dismantled. And I couldn't find easily when it was dismantled. But it started out on DNR land, and then we did a swap, and it became Hoosier National Forest. And then at some point, the Hoosier took down most of its towers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But she was on, on the job when the second largest fire in southern Indiana, in, in European times anyway, happened. And so that's just kind of a cool story, and she would be happy to tell it to you anytime. She's gone now, but <laughs> she told it to anybody that would listen. And it really was a, one of those hair-raising times, but it, it was in 1964. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Maybe I could. I was just trying. Yeah? Keep that on for a minute. I'm only halfway through reading. Well, no, I was going to go over it, but I leaned it back so I could see it better. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I lived that fire. You were there? It stopped at the edge of a farm. Wow, okay. Well, yeah, so then you could probably tell the story. But it just amazes me when I look through. So these are some of the notes that I condensed down. But all the people that were called out to help, so it lasted for four days. And they called out, one of the first people she called out were all the people from Carpenter Body Works to come out. And they went to the high school there in Mitchell. And they loaded up all the high school boys to yes, come help. So, oh, yeah. Well, oh, uh-huh. Yes, we all left. <laughs> <laughs> so the girls just got to go home, huh? No, uh, the girls weren't trained to fight fire. I don't. Uh, maybe you went and did something. I, I was at the Red Cross station. Oh, okay. So you helped in some way. Good. Well, it was in my backyard. Oh, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and the, it, well, it would have gotten put out much faster, except one landowner refused to let anybody come onto his land, and so it burned onto his land. Oh my gosh. And. Later, the law enforcement got him, and I don't know what he was fined or what. But then it 
they went home because they couldn't fight the fire there and they thought, well, I keep hitting you. So then the next morning, what did she say? Something about it's all over the place or something. So it really took off. And so she stayed in her tower. She didn't want to abandon it. She said she felt like a smoked herring. And they said, it's not safe. You've got to leave. So Paul Sanders, some of you may have knew Paul Sanders, but he actually went and he protected her tower because he knew how much it meant to her. And so they made her leave. And then Paul Sanders was a conservation officer and he stayed there and protected the tower. But it ended up being 2,494 acres. The next, the biggest fire was actually, and they both started here in Lawrence County, which is an odd claim to fame, but the other one started in Bryantsville and went all the way up past, up pretty much to Hardin Ridge and way over into the wilderness. So, and it was twice as big, so. Yeah, this is funny. Yeah, so. If you don't mind. No, go ahead. The, the first day, Dad took us kids, my brother and I and my two cousins, Uh huh. and he said, there's smoke up here, we should go check that out. So we jumped in the little, he took the tractor, uh -huh. some shovels, and his kids to go see where the fire was. Right. It was just up the road. And we got up there and Dad decided we should not stay. <laughs> Probably not, a good place for kids. It was all red and roaring. I can remember seeing fire. And yeah. And we came back home and yes, they started. And so we, we walked. Dad walked the fire line mm -hmm. and with the bulldozers and it's for the, for the next few days. Yeah. And finally, how many acres were burned or how much was burned? So that's on the bottom. It was 2,494 acres. Wow. So how many square miles is 2,494? Well, I mean, I don't know. 160 acres is a square mile. Okay. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Is several square miles? No. Yeah. 600 I don't know. Square miles. See, yeah. I, okay. So that would be like four, four square miles. miles. Five miles. My math is <laughs> 640 acres is a square mile. Yeah. So that'd be about five square miles. Five. Okay. Oh my gosh. That yeah. Is so and I thought I'd heard it jumped Highway 50. Do you remember? Because it didn't it sound like it did in here. Yeah. If so maybe go, they were just afraid that it would jump Highway 50. Were, it's, if you go up Sherman Road, uh -huh. uh, if you know exactly where to look at the uh, curve, you could see the line. Okay. The okay. There's still a, yeah. it's a shadow, but huh. uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. What about the land now? Like this was uh, whatever, 64. 50 years ago, it, has it, are there trees? I, I don't, oh, it's, yeah. I think it's fine. Yeah. yeah. You couldn't tell. It's if, pretty resilient. If you've driven to my house, yeah. the other side of Sherwood Road was the, from our house was what was burning. And it's forest now. It's mm -hmm. all forest. It's, all it's amazing. Forest. I mean, I've been out west where big trees, and then you go back in 10 years, and it's it's little trees, but you can't tell necessarily that it was devastation. Yeah. So it's very, okay, yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to yeah. let you know because. Uh -huh. Dutch Ridge Road. Uh-huh. And the Dutch Ridge Fire in 52. Yeah. Uh, now you can't tell it. Except no. Except the only thing you can, are the, are the, the fine trees. That they came in and planted. Yes. Huge pine trees. <laughs> right. Yeah. So these were yeah. replacement trees uh -huh. that they planted. Yeah. They didn't just leave it to grow up on its own. Okay. Oh, well, what happened there? <laughs> okay. So some other towers were in Martin County, Monroe, Orange, Owen, Perry, and we'll go over some of those. Well, what am I doing here? Okay. I hope I didn't delete something. But anyway, so the Willow Valley Tower, many of you also may have climbed. It's the same. You know, oh, I'm doing something and it's not going there. Fire. So why is that? Huh. Okay, anybody know what I'm doing? Did we knock something loose? I went to what? So start the, just close it all down. No, I, I, I just uh, restart the slideshow. Yeah, Can you hit the yeah, escape button and get no, out of the slideshow? No, no, no. It's marked. It's not working. It's locked, but. We're not seeing. Uh, huh. You're getting. Yeah. That's crazy. There's all these empty slides in here no, now, which I don't know where they go. It's like we're not getting them. It's not connected. I don't think I knocked this thing when I. When you 
when you have it in blank, what happened there? Well, I just, I just mean there's blank slides that weren't there before. When you hit something and it went Sorry, everybody. You want me to just close the whole PowerPoint? I think that would help. Save the changes. Just don't save. Okay. Coming back up. Okay. Well, how do I make it go forward? Okay, maybe it'll be fine now. Yeah. Okay, so here's the next batch. <laughs> Fingers crossed it'll be all right now. So, sure. All these trees. Uh huh. And now with the farm, you and myself. There's a song about them. I think that I shall never see you again. No poems on the leaves standing there. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a thing. It's got a long stem. Can you hear that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always a good. <laughs> they are your friends. Okay, so the ch the tower at Martin State Forest, also built by the CCC. Um, this one, if you climb it, I would just warn you that the safety mesh makes some of us kind of nervous. <laughs> Most of them have very sturdy looking, so if you happen to trip and fall, you won't fall over it. But if, I mean, that's an example of it. <laughs> so hold on tight. Mostly fire towers don't make me nervous, but this one I thought, well, if somebody did trip, that looks a little dangerous. So this is Morgan Monroe, and this is one, they got the same ARR, so that's when they built it. And you can see, you're talking about trees. Some of these are not as tall as you'd think they would be, and this one, um, I don't see a picture of it now, but some of them are not that tall today, because, and you can't hardly see over the trees, because they didn't have to be. When they were built, there were no trees really to look over. Yeah. They just had to look over the, the hills. But now the trees have grown up as tall as they are. So this one, they, took, they really did a masterful job. They took it all the way down. You can see, and I went up, because Bev said, you gotta come see this. So they took it all the way down. They totally refurbished it, these YACC crews, and then they put it back up again with cranes. And so, anyway, I went up to see it both ways. Young Adult Conservation Corps. Yeah, I think that was it. So it was a great project for them. So this is McCormick's Creek, and the friends of McCormick's Creek paid for this. Again, this was their tower, and this is a fairly short tower. And I remember when I climbed it before, I thought, you can't even, you're just looking at the top of the trees, you can't see anywhere. So they did cut some of their trees, so after they redid it, you can actually see a little ways anyway. But their friends group raised almost $100,000, I think, to pay to refurbish it. And they actually put glass in the windows. You'll notice when you climb most of these, there's no glass in the windows because vandals usually break them out. But We'll see how long the glass lasts. <laughs> when I manned towers and when we were actually working in them, it had glass because it could be kind of cold. Do people really ban those towers now? Or do you well, no, and that's what some of them have said. They were, act well, this one active until 1967. Although, and, and I'll get to it, but sometimes on really bad days, they would have us, yeah, okay. And that one's still there, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna get to that one too. So I'll ha I have pictures of it. So, um, so these are some of the towers. And there's one of these that's a kind of a mystery. So Winnemac Tower is up at Tippy Canoe, and that's one that you can climb. That's kind of a nice one. And Lincoln is the tallest one that I think is left. It's 120 foot. You can see from this one, you're looking down at somebody. That's a long ways down. <laughs> somebody on the ground. So if you're worried about heights, that one's pretty tall. And then this is Wabachi. That's one. Wabachi, yeah. And so that's the one she's talking about. And this one's really cool. Again, the Friends Group raised the money to save this one. It's 100 foot tall, and they raised $75,000 and made all the repairs. The light thing, they have light shows at Christmas. So they have, for $5, you get to come through the gate, and they have a light show in the campground. And then they play Christmas music, and it's like the tower dances, the light show. It's so cool. And so. It was, it was built in the 1930s. Mm hmm. And, and the steel workers and the works progress. And yeah. CCC. And w, yeah, CCC or WPA built almost all of them. Yeah, it's a cool tower. So, <laughs> although it made me laugh, I was up there not too long ago because that's where the bison are too. And you can look from this tower, you can look and see the bison, you can see the lake. It's really cool. 
But so when I went up, there was this man standing at the bottom, and I said, are you getting ready to go up, sir? And he says, well, I'm trying to decide. If I start up, I'll go all the way to the top. And I said, oh, it's cool, you should go up. He said, well, I may. So I climb up to the top, and I'm looking around, and then I start to go down, and I see him coming up on all fours. He's <laughs> like a bear, you know? So I wait for him, because I didn't want to try to cross him. So he finally gets to the top, and he gets to the top, and he's, he's just sitting in the corner. <laughs> and I said, are you all right? He said, I'm never doing this again, but I made it to the top. <laughs> I said, good for you. And I said, you should stand up and look. No, I'm not standing up. <laughs> you know, when, we were, when I was growing up forever, uh -huh. we, we called that the CCC camp. It was on a state park. And there probably was a camp there, yeah. Uh, that's what it was called, uh -huh. CCC park or CCC. Yeah, well, I bet there was a camp there. <laughs> that's an Indian name, Abachi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they call it, different people call it different things. I don't know what's the right thing. Yeah, but that's a cool, and they do have bison there now, too. So if you go there, you can see both. I didn't. Really? Okay. 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 Well, and this is kind of a mystery, because there's a weed patch tower in Brown County, and then there's a, a lily tower. And the lily tower is supposed to be in this private IU preserve, and then the... Weed Patch Tower is supposed to be in Brown County, but then the sign at, <coughs> this calls this the Weed Patch Tower and this is Brown County. So I think something happened to the Weed Patch Tower, the real Weed Patch, anyway, I think it got moved and replaced because the, the names don't sound right. But anyway, you can climb the one and I don't know what happened to the other. I need to go try to solve that mystery. At Crane, there's four towers. Three of them are still there in some form. One's a water tower down, one just has an antenna on top and the fourth was torn down. But they do have their towers. And I think this is interesting. So when the Forest Service bought its first 40-acre track, when they came in and started buying land on the Hoosier, that first 40-acre track was picked to be where the Hickory Ridge Tower is now. So that was their plan. The first priority was to put up a lookout tower because they thought it was that important. And then the second thing they were going to do was to to buy Bologna Nursery and start planting trees because they realized it was so important to protect the forest from fire and plant trees. And in 1981, they turned it over. So Bologna now belongs to the state. In 81, they turned it over to the state. But that's how important lookout towers were back then. So the Hickory Ridge Tower was erected in 1936 by the CCC. It's pretty tall. It's the tallest of the ones that were on the Hoosier. And it's the only one left standing. The Hoosier tore all the rest of theirs down. But a lot of the Hoosiers had houses at the bottom and they had wells and garages and so they had more facilities with theirs. Latrines, which are always kind of nice. But anyway, those are some pictures of the Hickory Ridge site. And that's the early um, first towerman and his wife. And that's a guy building, digging the footers because they have seven foot by seven foot footers. So it's a seven foot block. So that's how you know they're sturdy. They're not going to tip over real easy because that's a whole lot of concrete that's holding them up. Um, so they, the CCC boys talked about, they really liked to help out as lookouts. I don't think any of them were full-time lookouts, but they were like, the, the, they filled in. And visitors would come, everybody liked to climb the lookouts. And so they would have a log book and people would write little notes about how beautiful it was. And so they got to meet people. And they used to have where you could climb a log book, or, wait, no, I'm on the wrong one. Okay, so <laughs> I'm looking ahead, I guess. Um, but they said that really all you had to do to be a, a, a backup lookout was to be able to have pretty good eyesight. So they didn't give you much training. <laughs> to be a real lookout, you had to have a little more training. Um, and then they had telephone lines. They were about the only telephones, which is one reason they needed these lookouts, because people couldn't just call in and say, there's a fire next, in my next door pasture or whatever, it's because they didn't have any way to report it. And so these, the, the towers were connected by telephones to the district ranger and to um, the CCC camp so that they could report the fires. That's my uncle, too, George. Oh, was it? OK. <laughs> And that's his wife, too, the, the couple that were standing there? Or? Oh, I didn't notice. I just saw his name. Oh, OK. Oh, he, yeah, so he was a CCC lookout. So he worked in the CCC camp. Yes. OK. And so we also did a lot of fire education. I brought my friend Smokey Bear over there. So Smokey Bear came out and helped. And the, so the fire wardens, I talked about training the boys. So the fire wardens were, were scheduled, and they brought the boys out and taught them how to use those tools so that if they were called out from school, they knew what a flapper was and a council tool and a mattock and all those tools were. And then they had like assistants. So each one had about, I think they were fire guards. So they had about 10 men because they had 10 sets of 10 tools in those little red um, storage units. And some of you may remember they used to be around the, the 
um, forest. Do you remember seeing those scattered around? They were painted red with a little yellow sign on the front, and they had the fire warden signs. When I came here in the 80s, I remember seeing them around. Nobody remembers. <laughs> okay, well, they really were here. I remember seeing them. <laughs> they weren't important to you guys, but... And uh, when I was little, I remember we learned the Smokey Bear song in school. How many of you know the Smokey Bear song? Nobody? <laughs> well, <laughs> I still know it. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, they came and taught us in school because they wanted all to know about fire. With the ranger's hat and shovel and a pair of dungarees, you can spot them in the forest, always sniffing at the bees. Doesn't sound important. <laughs> Oh well. Okay, so now I was going to tell you a little about, and I'm sorry, I meant to be done by now. So, so the Towerman, you're, you're, this is a picture from out west, but so the, the cab is seven foot by seven foot, kind of like the footers are, and so half of the floor is a trap door, which is why, and you've got to, so when you come up on the steps, you lift it with, you unlock it, and then you lift it with your shoulder, and then you push it up. So that's why I think if you're climbing up on a ladder, to be able then to lift it <laughs> would be really tough. So, you know, I don't know how they did it with, with the ladder. Yeah. But anyway, so, I mean, it wasn't that hard on the step, so I'd unlock it, and then I could push it up with my shoulder and my arm and flip it up. And then once you're inside, you set it down, and then you, have a, you don't have to worry about falling through the hole. <laughs> so, although when you go visit, there's usually no trap door because they've taken it out so people can. So then you have to worry about falling through the hole, so do pay attention to that. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, you have all these weather instruments, because if you're working as a lookout, you have to tell them what the weather is, because they have, um, site weather is different than what it might be in Bedford or wherever. So you've got a sling psychometry, you've got a, a weather meter, you've got the humidity, you know, test the humidity. So you have to run down and take it at the ground level and about 20 foot up. They don't care what it is 100 foot up, but they care what it is where the fire is going to be. So you've got to do that about one every an hour. So if you're on one of those ladder ones, that's a lot of going up and down. But it's not so bad with the step one. So you've got to take the weather and you have a log book. You keep records of everything. You're calling it in. I always had a radio pretty much like what he has. And you have your call sign. So when you get there in the morning, you say, and it's always a long one. This is Eastwood Tower, KB48326. Tina Ligman on duty, and then when you sign off with that, and these old guys, when I would interview them about their towers, they said, oh yeah, I'd log in every morning, they'd know exactly what their call sign is. I, I don't have a clue what mine was, <laughs> but they know it because they did it every day so often. And so you keep track in your logbook. This guy, for some reason, must have done it on a typewriter. I just had a little spiral book. And, but then you had your chair, your broom, and then you had this little wooden thing with insulators, like what you see on phone lines, so just those little porcelain things. So if you would get a random storm, you were supposed to jump up and stand on that little thing, and they said you'd be safe. And again, I don't know if anyone ever electrocuted in a storm. Yeah, I mean, they are kind of lightning rods, so. I always believed the government. <laughs> So that's what they said, don't touch anything if there's lightning. Just stand on your little stool and you'll be safe. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever it takes, exactly. <laughs> so that's what we did. So anyway, so you, the, the way it works is you triangulate it. So if this was Eastwood, is Shell Mountain was my tower. So I would say, oh, I think I see a smoke. And so I'd watch it for a little bit. Yes, it looks like a smoke. So I would call it in. So this is Eastwood Tower. I see a smoke at 326 degree azimuth which this is, so this is my Osborne Firefinder, and you look through, you can see this guy's looking through this part, you look through this part, and you can actually see the elevation, you, you can't see the distance very well, some of them said they could, but I never got that good, but you can see the elevation, the, the distance by azimuth, like a compass azimuth, so you'd call it in and say, you know, it's 322 degrees azimuth from Eastwood Tower, and your tower is the point right in the middle. So you would swing it around whichever direction the smoke is coming and you'd call it in. So then this guy would take, it's like a magnet board, and he would take little pins out and put it down and then he would call, like Sinkin' Creek was one of my other towers in Fremont that also could overlap with me. Do you see any smoke? Because it would be out in the distance of, of Sinkin' Creek. And he would look, he said, oh, I think I might see something at such a degree azimuth. So then he would run it up and then wherever they cross is where the smoke is. So then he would call somebody to go check it out. And if it looked like it was a big smoke, then he'd start calling the fire wardens, round up the school boys, <laughs> whatever, however big he thought it needed to check it out. So that's kind of how the, the firefinders worked. And this, I thought this 
it was kind of a fun group. That was the fire wardens in southern Indiana in like 1950 or something. They took pictures of all of them. And it said to be a fire warden, you had to be a high type, interested in conservation, have a vehicle and a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> a fine fellow, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Fine fellow. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. But you could spend a lot of time, and I mentioned that clear the tower. So sometimes they just said, Tina, go clear your tower. So I, if I was working somewhere else, I'd just drive up and go run up my tower and check it out and see what I saw. And it looks clear. If it didn't look clear, then I'd have to watch and see if, there, if that smoke was going to amount to anything or if it was just somebody burning brush. And if, if I couldn't come, then they might send, well, like the sinking creek, the one that just said had a ladder up. And I, I went to see those people not long ago, and, and Marvin died about a year later, so I was so glad I went. But his wife, Pat, they lived in a house at the bottom, and it had no plumbing. They lived there for years and years, but she said, oh, I hated it when I had to clear the tower when Marvin was busy. And I'd have to climb that ladder, and I'd have to look around. <laughs> but she said, but I did it. And back in those days, you know, nobody got paid extra for that. So she was just the wife that lived in the house, and she'd climb the tower and look around. Yeah, she just did what she had to do, but she said it scared me every time. It didn't scare Marvin, but it sure did scare his little wife. So anyway, so you'd clear the tower, and that was what you did. So just. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. Clear the, tower. Clear the tower. Yeah. So they would do that. And even today, on the heart in the Hoosier, a few times they would say, "Somebody's reported that there might be a fire in the wilderness." And is anybody out in the area of the wilderness? And so if I was out there doing something, I would call in and say, "Yeah, I'll go clear the tower." So I would drive up and climb Hickory Ridge. And because what if nobody's caught? I mean, I mean, people wouldn't necessarily be near the tower. Right, well, yeah, so you just listen on the radio, and if you were willing to do it, and a lot of people don't want any part of it, but if you're willing to do it, then you can climb and clear the tower. Okay, so, and we still do it occasionally, and they really are very safe. A lot of people are kind of scared about towers. This one was a tower that was not far from me where I worked in Missouri, and it blew down in a tornado, which lots of things blow down in tornadoes, you know, so that was sad for that tower, but yeah, I mean, they very rarely blow down, so... So I really am almost done. So this was aerial detection. So planes and telephones kind of did towers in a lot of ways. But I thought this, and Clarice Carroll talked about this. She said, so when I went out in my tower, I would run the flag up, and that meant that I was in my tower. So if, in World War II especially, they had a lot of civil defense, which were just kind of volunteer pilots that on bad days would fly and make sure that, the, that the, um, there weren't fires. And so if there was a tower was manned and they saw something of concern, they would write a note and drop it there by the tower. And so <laughs> you saw the plane drop a note, you'd run down and read it, and then you could call it in on your radio that the plane says that there might be something of concern. So which is, and they said if the tower wasn't manned, that these civil patrols would buzz the fire station or the police station until somebody came out to look and then they would drop the note there. <laughs> so that just seems bizarre to me. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, but then communication improved, and then the, they got, so they had the radios that could talk, and so, yeah. Yeah, so by 1972, they could talk to the ranger stations and all, and so the towers were needed less, and the residents started being able to call in their own fires, and so they didn't need us as much. And so, I know Rowena said this is a good time of year to do the program, because people then could go out and see the fall colors, and that is a beautiful time to climb the towers. And so... Indiana Tourism put this site up, I don't know, four or five years ago, and they picked 13 towers that are usually open, easy to climb, and so it's on the Indiana Tourism site. Visit indiana.com, and then if you just visit Indiana Fire Towers, I think it'll come up, but it picked out 13 towers they recommend you climb. And so it is, that's a nice site, and it has several of these that I mentioned. And that's all I got. So I don't know if you have any questions, but. Great. Yes. <laughs> so. Well, thank you all for listening. I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, was there a time period between people being in the towers and they discontinued that there was electronic surveillance, either cameras or... They're still trying that. They do that out west some. Yeah. And it's not been real successful. But a lot of states still have people, man. When I was I hacking the Appalachian Trail in New Jersey, it was so fun because they had all the towers open and there were, it was during fire season. And so I would climb up and then I 
I said something about, oh, I'm so glad you're in the tower. I said, I'm Tina from Indiana. He said, are you Tina Ligman? I said, I am. And he said, I'm Bill Cobb, because he was in New Jersey chairman. And so I've talked to him on national calls before. So it was like, oh. <laughs> so, but yeah, they manned theirs still. I thought since we, we were back here in 04, mm -hmm. and I was thinking somebody told me that there was still some sort of electronic monitoring going on for the Georgia Tower. Oh, well, I don't know. I had not heard that, yeah. that they ever did it in Indiana. Okay. But. Maybe I just crazy. Okay, but they did do it some out west, but I've never heard in Indiana they ever tried to do it. You know, it's all the Indiana towers are in the southern part of the state. So Bocce, one is in the Mark Tiffany Canoe. Yeah, heard, almost all the rest. The down yes. Yeah. I don't think there were ever a lot in the north. It just the emphasis wasn't there. They didn't have enough fires. Well, they was farmland. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's easier to put the fires out. Yeah. And some of the stories they tell, I was talking to somebody who, I think she was in the Hickory Ridge Tower, and she said her husband, um, the, the guy called from the tower, and he says, ma'am, I think your, tower, your, your farm is on fire. And she said, my well had gone dry, and she said, my husband had gone to try to get some water in town, and she said, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. She said, the only water I have, I'm boiling potatoes on the stove, so until he gets back, I got no water. And he said, do you have a tractor? Can you drive it? And she said, I can. And he said, well, go out and, and drive a, a line around it and then take that water with the potatoes and throw it on the fire. She said, so that's what I did, and I got the fire out. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, but <laughs> I will let you get home for your birthday party. <laughs> okay.